Hello YouTube, this is Douglas, and welcome to my fifth Voxel Game Engine devlog. I have an incredible amount of progress to show off this week, and I'm quite excited to present it to you. In this episode, I'll be talking all about how I added multiplayer networking to my Voxel game. I'll discuss both the implementation details and general design philosophy, and demonstrate the ability for multiple players to interact and modify the Voxel world in real time. But first, let's start with a little bit of background. I'm building what is intended to be a massive Voxel platform, a scalable game architecture that will allow users to create, destroy, and extend with mods or plugins. The goal is to have a single game client, which can be downloaded or used on the web to play mini games, explore Minecraft-like sandbox worlds, and more. To accomplish this, I'm writing my engine in Rust and compiling to the web with WebAssembly. Multiplayer is a major facet of this project for me. When I was a kid, one of my favorite parts of video games was playing online. Even before Minecraft, I spent much time playing a game called Toontown Online. It was an MMORPG in which you controlled a cartoon character and fought evil robots. While the game was fairly old and somewhat repetitive in its content, it was very much loved by its community. In fact, fans fully recreated the game when Disney shut it down. The reason for its success, I think, was Toontown's multiplayer. The game was designed in such a fashion that one had to work with other players in order to progress. This led to a great deal of cooperative play and socialization. This left an impression on me, which lasts to this day. When I played other games, like Minecraft, I searched for similar cooperative multiplayer experiences. Now, in my game, I want to give players a similar opportunity. I want to make it exceedingly easy for users to play together and even join each other's private games. This is an area in which Minecraft Java Edition, in my view, falls short. Given this situation, allow users to play together in all game modes and situations, I got to thinking. The easiest and most straightforward way to do this would be to host servers and facilitate user games online. This is expensive, though, and would require users to upload their data to the cloud before playing. Ultimately, it would be better, and the network performance would actually be faster if players could connect to one another directly. So, what I was truly looking for was a means of peer-to-peer -peer networking. Peer-to-peer -peer networking, allowing us user computers to talk to one another directly, is a difficult thing due to firewalls and varying network topologies. But this was a feature I really wanted to see, so I got down to researching. Since I needed my game to run in a browser, I would be limited to web networking technologies. That left me only three options, HTTP requests, WebSockets, and WebRTC. HTTP requests would be far too slow for gaming, and WebSockets aren't designed for peer-to-peer. -peer. But what about WebRTC? I didn't really know what this was when I first started work on my game. It turns out, though, that WebRTC stands for Web Real-Time Communications. It's the cross-browser standard API that programs like Discord and Microsoft Teams use for audio and video conferencing. And what does that entail? Sending user audio and video data across the network to other clients, peer-to-peer. -peer. Bingo. I would use WebRTC to send game data to other clients. Looking back, it almost seems too convenient to be true. But apparently, this breathtaking technology has been around since 2011. Let's break down how the WebRTC peer connection model works. In a simple client-server network model, the client simply sends some messages to the server. The server responds, and a connection is established. Easy. With peer-to-peer, -peer, though, things are considerably more difficult. There are two main issues. One, allowing clients to find one another.
clients can't know the address that they should connect to in advance, so something is needed to help clients discover one another. Two, the clients need a way to bypass firewalls and port forwarding to exchange information. As such, connecting clients with WebRTC goes as follows. Two clients tell a third-party server, a signaling server, that they want to connect. The third-party server sends connection information back to both clients, and then the clients attempt a direct connection through a protocol called ICE. Once the clients are connected, they can talk directly without going through the server. In order to allow clients to talk to one another, I would need such a signaling server. For my final game, I'll need a server anyway to handle login, user accounts, and more. This is the perfect server to help users join others' games. I wrote the signaling server in the Go programming language because I needed some experience in it for an internship that I'm currently doing. The signaling server is currently quite simple. Users can connect, create accounts, and then post open games. Other users subsequently request to join the games, and the information that WebRTC needs is forwarded to both clients. The server is accessed using HTTP requests, just like loading a website. After the Go service was complete, I set out to add networking to the Voxel engine. Because multiplayer is such an integral part of the game engine, I decided to design things around it from the start. To do so, I moved all of the game logic, storing entities, running world updates, and the like, onto a separate thread, the game server thread. In this model, the engine runs an internal server to which the local player connects whenever you start the game. This way, the code for single player is no different than the code for multiplayer. The player who is hosting the game is still just another client on the internal game server. Building off of this construct, I added logic for the client to take server input perform graphics tasks and record user input, and then send the data back to the internal server. This logic was abstracted over the type of network connection employed, so it would work for both a local player and someone connected over WebRTC. Finally, it came time to put everything together. I hooked up the signaling server's REST API to my Voxel engine and wrote a very simple script to synchronize the screen color between connected clients. I compiled the code, ironed out a few final glitches, and voila! As you can see, two separate Chrome windows are running the Voxel engine. The color on screen between both is synchronized, however, as the client on the left is hosting a game to which the client on the right is connected. But of course, just one color on a screen is boring. This project is about voxels, after all, and we haven't touched a single voxel yet in this video. So I set out to make things interesting. First, I set up 3D controls and made it so that multiple clients could see one another on screen, moving around. In this screen capture, each client is represented by a triangle. I didn't like the jittery movement of the clients, which is caused by network updates and latency. So I implemented a system to interpolate the motion of networked objects. Now, you can see that the players move smoothly as the triangles cross the screen. After that, it was time to bring back the voxels. I reintegrated the voxel generation and rendering system into the engine, placing the voxel octree data on the internal game server so that it could be shared between clients. I verified that multiple clients could see the voxel octree, then incrementally added the ability to place and destroy these voxel spheres. On screen is the end result. You can see two separate clients connected and modifying the same voxel world. I have to admit, I spent at least half an hour just flying around, placing these voxels and watching them appear. Since I last uploaded two months ago, I've been working on this project every spare minute I can find. To have such tangible technology, 
and, I might add, so many ideas for the future. Feels great. While I am not quite there yet, I am hoping to have an online, browser-based demo posted in a few months. Allow me to wrap up this video with two brief announcements. First, there's much, much more going on behind the scenes that I didn't get to talk about here. Entity component systems, event systems, Octree modification with SIMD, web workers, and more are topics about which I have additional details to share. Therefore, I intend to release another video next week covering those topics. If you are interested and want to see it, please go ahead and subscribe. That leads me to my second point. This channel has reached 700 subscribers, which is truly marvelous. I think when I posted my previous video, we only hit about 240. I can't thank everyone enough for the interest in my project. Let's see if we can hit 1,000 subs. Anyhow, thank you all very much for watching. If you have any thoughts or questions, please do place them in the comment section below. Otherwise, until next time.